current clients. I'm so excited you're here. But for those of you that do not know, I wanted to give you a little bit of who I am, why I put these on, why this is something that I choose to offer, all right? So hi, my name is Liz Martin. My pronouns are she, her. I am a sex-positive parenting coach, the founder of Empower the Talk, a certified doula, and a certified sex educator. I have been in the field of social work for eight years now, which feels crazy to say. I have been self-employed doing this specific work for the last four. This week, I am going to empower you to have the tough conversations with yourself and with any kiddos that are in your home while giving you the education that you need to do it confidently. That's the promise that I'm making to you. All right, let me say that again. I'm going to empower you to have the tough conversations with yourself and with any kiddos in your home while giving you the education that you need to do it confidently. I think many of us come from a space that sexual health and conversations around sex doesn't evoke a feeling of confidence. You will walk away this week with that feeling, okay? I want to share a little bit of a disclaimer here, and I'll probably say this every single night, all right? The topics that we are discussing and the things that we're talking about inside of this workshop for many people, could create some feelings of discomfort, right? There's probably already something that I've said that creates a feeling of discomfort for you. If this is not something that you've worked through before or your story around sex includes trauma, please, please take care of yourself this week, okay? I think that every piece of content that I'm sharing this week is valuable and will support you in more ways than you realize. But you are in charge of your body and you have to take care of yourself through this. If things come up and you need support, feel free to reach out to me. I am more than happy to be a person that is able to walk through that with you, to support you in that. But I will also give you recommendations for licensed therapists because this is very, very real feelings that come up. Okay, so be aware of that. Take care of you. You're in charge of your body and you have to decide what's safe for your body. All right. Okay, go ahead and drop an emoji in the comments if you are still here with me. I'm gonna take some coffee. I probably will lose my voice by the end of this. We're just gonna prepare for that now. It's gonna be fine. Right. All right. I'm so excited to have you guys on live too. It like gets me excited versus just recording a video and not really knowing who's there. (laughs) That makes me really excited. Okay. So I got that disclaimer in. I want you to get the most out of this workshop. All right. Use this. This workshop is not something that I offer all the time. Number one. Number two, I'm offering it for free for the last time. The last time. Okay. This workshop, if I bottled it up and sold it, it would be $2,499. That's what I would sell it for. Okay. This is the last time that I'm offering it for free. So use this week, use this week and use it well, absorb the content, work through the action steps, really be intentional about the work that you're doing. Okay. Because again, this is the last time that it happens for free. The action steps will be posted each day after the video. It will be a very clear little picture. You'll be able to know exactly what you need to do. Think of it as your homework, all right? The reason that we're given homework in an education setting is to implement, implement the knowledge that we've just gained, right? So that's the purpose of these. I know that for many of you, the education that I'm offering each night, you probably haven't thought about before or thought about in this way. The action steps give you an opportunity to implement the work that you're doing. If we are just sitting in a space of taking in education and just taking it in, but not doing anything about it, it's it's not beneficial. It's not serving us, right? Like it, it is of no benefit to do that. So the goal is that each night we learn the education and then we implement. Learn the education and then implement over and over and over. All right. So why are you here? 
why did you decide to attend this workshop? Many of you have been in my space for a while, and many of you are brand freaking new to this space, okay? I hear a lot of different reasons as to why people come into my space, so I would love to hear which of these resonates with you. I would say that these are the most common things that I hear as to why you're here. So if one of them sticks out to you, put it in the comments. I'm like, oh yeah, well, that's me, that's me, all right? So number one, from parents, I hear a lot about the feeling that they are worried about fucking their kids up and they come to me for education because that is a deep seated fear that they have. And every, nearly every parent that I have spoken to or worked with has shared that fear that they are worried about fucking their kids up. Okay. From millennials specifically, I hear a lot about them having grown up in an environment that was sex negative or at the very minimum, just not talked about. It was taboo. Sex was an off limits conversation because of how taboo it was. From those of you that grew up in a faith practice, I hear a lot about the narrative that sex was sinful or wrong, only to be done in a certain context and leaving out any of the conversations of consent, safety, or pleasure. From those that have experienced sexual trauma, I hear the story of that they don't want to have anything to do with it because it triggers them, or the side of experiencing any sexual pleasure brings up deep feelings of shame or control narratives. Every person's story is unique. Every person's story is different, but I tend to see a lot of similarities in the clients that I work with and a lot of similarities in the stories that come up. Maybe none of these stories are yours. Maybe none of that resonates for you. But I also know that there's several of you in here right now that those things that I said resonated and are a part of your story. Whatever the story is that got you into this space today, I want you to hear that we only have one journey through this. One journey through parenthood where we have the power to create safer and more satisfying environments for our kids. One journey to experience highly pleasurable consensual sex, one journey to explore this story that has been treated as taboo and left in the unknown for too long. There's one journey through this. It is time to put in the work to change that narrative around sex. Hear that again. It is time to put in the work to change that narrative around sex. In our eight days together, you will walk away with an understanding of your personal story around sex and how it impacts more than just what you choose to do in the bedroom. You will have a framework to create a safe narrative around what sex is for you. You will have a confidence mindset around the importance of having the talk and what goes into that? You will have the, what around four, the ability to educate and create safe conversations around masturbation. You'll have a framework for talking about peer interactions with your children, positive, negative, or romantic relationships, and how consent affects all of that. I told you I was bringing it this week and I'm going to bring it all. I will be here every night bringing it all. But tonight we are at the very beginning and we're going to start right here. We all come into this with what could be very similar or very different stories and beliefs. So tonight you will learn how to unpack what you believe about sex how to give yourself permission to experience pleasure, how to integrate a daily pleasure practice, and then actual statistics on the importance 
of sexual health. It is going to be a good night, all right? So let's dive in. Drop an emoji in the comments to show me that you are still here with me. We are jumping in. We're going to learn about healing your relationship with sex and why it impacts more than just sex. I just, I love seeing all the emojis in the comments. It just like makes me happy. Is that just like proof of how much of a millennial I am that I just love seeing all the emojis in the comments? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. All right. Let me scroll my notes here. So we're going to dive in, in this very first part of unpack what you believe about sex. Okay. I shared in the beginning some various reasons as to why you may have chosen to be in this space, why you decided that this was a workshop that you wanted to attend. What I love about this space, many of you know that this is a new space, a new group, a new space for this workshop to be held. Every single one of you opted in. You chose to participate. You said, yes, that's something that I want to be a part of. That is something that I want education on. I'm choosing to participate in that. You all decided to participate. And our story truly impacts every belief that we have about sex. Every single one of them, okay? The, the story that we have there, oops, hold on. I forgot to add my extra slides on here. Pause one second. Slides. Okay, there we go. We're ready. We're ready. All right. All of that impacts what our belief around sex is, what our story around sex is. I'm going to put a few phrases up here on the screen. And some of them are going to be really uncomfy for some of you. Okay, so prepare yourself. Sit in that. And others are going to be like, oh, yeah, that's pleasurable. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Okay. Being sex positive doesn't come with this expectation that you are into everything. All right. Let me say that again. Being sex positive does not come with the expectation that you are into everything. I am a certified sex educator that talks about sex quite literally every single day. In some capacity, I talk about sex every single day. And I can assure you that there are still things on my nope list. There are still things on that list, okay, that I'm not into. I can give you education on it. I can tell you how to do it safely. I can talk about consent inside of that, but it is on my no thank you list. Not interested in that not something I'm choosing to engage in. That's okay. Hear this in regards to those of you that are parents. Being a sex positive parent is more about facing the insecurities in yourself around sex than it is how you are parenting. When you rewrite your narrative on pleasure you allow space for your children to write theirs with education, consent, and safety. You are already a good parent, but you choosing to take ownership of your story around sex impacts not only your life, but the lives of those humans inside of your home. Not every person participating in this workshop is a parent. And I share that, that you don't have to be a parent to participate in this because so many of us are going through a journey of reparenting ourselves and reteaching ourselves the things that we could have been taught as children. So I'm going to share these activities on the screen. And what I want you to do and sit with is rate them in regards to risk level. Okay, so there's just a list of practices, of ways that you can engage with a partner or partners. I want you to rate them in your own way. There is no right or wrong answers to this, and you do not have to type it in the comments unless you choose to. What would be the greatest risk? 
versus the least risk. That's what I want you to do with this. I'm going to read, uh, let me take this off so you can see the very bottom of it. I'm going to read these so that you can hear them. Mutual masturbation. Where would you rate that? Anal sex. Fingering. Penis and vagina sex. Oral sex. Making out. Light bondage play. Light impact play. Video sex. Sending nude photos. Group sex. Penis and penis sex. Vagina and vagina sex. Where would you rate those? What would you put as the riskiest behavior? What comes up for you when you look at those words? Which ones make you like, oh, that, no, that's not for me. That's on my nope list. Which ones create that feeling for you? Which ones do you deem to be risky? I'm going to give you just a second here to look through those to sit with them just a little bit and see what comes up. the video so that you can go back and look at them. There is no, I just put on, I see a, a, a layer on the screen. <laughs> Sorry if that messes anyone's video up. Um, I will drop these in the comments so that you can see them a little bit better too. If you want to go a little bit deeper in what your ratings would be, how you would rate those in regards to risk. When you look at this list, There we go. <laughs> when you look at this list, there are so many factors that go into why. Ooh, did somebody send my audio shifted? Hold on, let's see here. Let's see. Does this sound any better? I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Does it sound okay? Any improvement in the audio? There should be, okay, cool, cool, cool. There should be captions too. If you're watching on uh, Facebook, there should be captions on the screen as well. Um, if you have that set up in Facebook, so you can use that as well. But let me know. Okay, it looks like I've got a guess there. All right. There are so many factors that impact this list and where you choose to re, re, put risk level, okay? To clarify again, there is no correct order. There is no correct answer to any of these. Your order is completely up to you. Your order is completely up to what feels right for you, okay? Things that could affect the order that you have are a 
comment that a parent made to you when you started dating. What the church taught you in purity culture. Things that you have tried and things that you have not tried. If you are a monogamous person, a polyamorous person, or casually dating, or you're single, all of those affect where you raise a risk. The degree to which you know your partner and their safer sex history. Your access to preferred barrier methods. All of those things impact where you rate risk. There are no wrong answers. I'm hearing that there's still a little issue with the time. Let me a little bit. Okay, any better for anyone? Can you put it in the comments if you can hear me okay? I see comments popping up. Anything improved with the audio? Okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay, that makes me so happy. <laughs> that makes me so happy. All right, all right. I see all the much better, much better. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, I'm glad you can hear me. You don't have to like lean in super close anymore. You can't. It's safe. It's safe. But there are no wrong answers, but so much of the rating that you just gave is based on what you were told to believe versus what you have explored to be true to yourself. Let me say that again. What you just rated those things is so much about what you were told to believe versus what you have explored to be true for yourself. How do we shift that? Move from what we were taught to what we know to be true for our bodies. I personally have a three-step process that I use when working with my clients. I use the process of identify, assess, and rewrite. This is the system that I use with every single client that I work with. I identify what is there. That is what I want you sitting with tonight. That is where I want your brain to just hyper-focus into. What is there? What do you believe about sex? What do you believe about it being right or wrong? What story of shame or guilt do you have around sex? What things trigger larger emotions of shame and guilt? What feels pleasurable for you? What fantasies do you have? All of that is where I want you sitting, okay? I want you focusing on that tonight. Identify where you are. The next step to that is assessing. We are going deep into that tomorrow, okay? Day two is that assessment process. The third step is the rewrite. My goal for you is that this comes from a space of comprehensive pleasure mindset. In order to get to that point of having a comprehensive pleasure mindset, you have to give yourself permission to experience pleasure. That's a hard step for many people. And I often see for those that identify as women that that is an even harder step to make. Permission to experience pleasure. Pleasure is a word that we often hear in correlation to sex. We often hear that used together. But what is the actual definition of pleasure? The definition is a feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. It's not sexual at all normalize the use of the word pleasure in the everyday. This coffee that I'm drinking, 
that is pleasurable. That brings pleasure to my body. Normalize the word. Pleasure is a welcomed experience in our bodies and our bodies crave pleasure. Why do you think we do things that feel good? Our bodies are hardwired to crave pleasure and we keep doing something again and again because it feels good. Cutting out pleasure is of no benefit to your body. Do the things that create more pleasure because your brain is already hardwired to experience pleasure. Expand the meaning of what pleasure is. It can allow for greater sexual experiences, but it isn't inherently sexual. It isn't something that has to be about sex. So redefine sex. The way you experience pleasure can shift for so many reasons. So if you're not willing to play with different forms of pleasure and expand the definition of what sex is, you may be having a lot less sex. You are allowed to define this word in the way that feels right for you. A feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. That is what pleasure is. And what your body craves. What is a pleasure practice? Okay, Have, has anybody ever, drop this in the comments, has anybody ever heard the terminology of a pleasure practice or has ever done one before or what it means or has experimented with it? I'd love to hear. A pleasure practice. A pleasure practice is a regular commitment to exploring pleasure each day. It can be as long as, or as short of an activity as you wish. Maybe you want to mindfully masturbate every day for a week and see what happens. Maybe you want to eat a slow meal with no distractions. How many moms are out there? Does that ever happen? Do you ever eat a meal slow and recognize the consistency of the food and the flavors and the spices and the temperature? Do we do that? No. No, because we're probably just eating our kids' leftovers that they didn't finish on their plate, right? We don't do that. We don't mindfully eat most of the time. Maybe it's gazing at the moon or the sun rising. Maybe it's choreographing your own musical. Maybe you are somebody that is like, dance is a thing for your brain and it does a lot for you. Maybe it's being really intentional about what that feels like in your body. Mom dinner is kids leftovers, 100%, 100%. <laughs> Whatever the practice is for you, no one needs to know what you do. This is just for you. This is a practice for your body, for your experience, and for you to connect with pleasure. The idea is for you to approach each practice in a way that is both mindful and embodied. For pleasure is the container by which we are inviting in more presence, meaning, and beauty into our lives. Let me say that again. For pleasure is the container by which we are inviting in more presence, meaning, and beauty into our lives. So how do we integrate a pleasure practice? How do we do that in a daily pleasure practice? First, get crystal clear with your intention. What do you want to start a pleasure practice? Why do you want to do it? What are you hoping it does for you? What do you want to see shift in your life, in your relationship, in your relationship to yourself, in your relationship to others? How do you want to feel your pleasure. What do you need to unlearn about pleasure? What needs healing through pleasure? Get crystal clear on what your intention is behind participating in a daily pleasure practice. Maybe you are somebody that likes to fly by the seat of your pants each day and feel into what would be most pleasurable for you in that day. 
Maybe you are a spontaneous individual and you can decide based on what has happened that day, what your experience is, what your pleasure practice will be. Perhaps you are more like me and I have to have structure for my brain to feel safe. Maybe you have a structure where you focus on one of the five senses each day of the week. Perhaps you'd like to start compiling your own bank of pleasure prompts or an Excel spreadsheet. If Excel spreadsheets just do magical things in your brain, make a spreadsheet of it. Make a paper list, a bunch of torn up pieces of paper, bunch of post-it notes, whatever it is, and you put them all together and you randomly grab one. You could group practices by sense, by energy level, by time commitment, or the season of your cycle when you might be most into it. Whatever container you can create for yourself that would make you feel most held, do that. There are no rules to a daily pleasure practice. You get to decide how that implements well into your life. If it helps for you, schedule in 10 to 20 minutes each day for your pleasure practice. Set alarms on your phone to remind you because I will forget. My brain has far too many things happening in it all day long that I will just get to the end of the day and forget. For me, saving it till just before a wind down ritual usually occurs, that works best at the very end of the day of like a relaxation piece of pleasure, like a little treat at the end of the day. Okay. Perhaps though you are more receptive to a morning time frame, right when you wake up or middle of the day on your lunch break, whatever it is above all remain flexible, allow each practice the time it requires and allow your body the time that it needs to fully drop into that experience to fully engage in pleasure. Yes, yes, make us feel held. I want to speak to those of you that are parents for just a second, that so often in the space of parenting, so many people are burnt out. So many people are struggling with that space of parenthood and that it can be incredibly stressful. And we oftentimes struggle with where we then feel held because we're always holding other beings. We're always holding the tiny humans in our home that need that as we should, but then where do we feel held? And I want you to give yourself permission that you're allowed to hold yourself. It's not just on your partner. It's not just on your family. It's not just on your friends. You get to have permission to hold yourself and to prioritize yourself. And for a lot of mamas specifically that I talk to, we struggle with that. We struggle with prioritizing ourselves. This minor practice of 10 to 20 minutes a day can be life changing. Life changing in the way that we respond to our bodies and the way in which we connect to our being and allow ourselves to hold our soul, to hold who we are as a being. Give yourself that permission to define what feels good for you and what creates pleasure for you. Set those alarms. Create a ritual out of it. Allow it to be something that you look forward to each day and that you can connect into. Another recommendation is to create a pleasure toolkit or an altar. All right. So what I mean by this is a basket or a certain part of your bedroom or a pile of objects that inspire pleasure. Grouping together maybe some flowers that you bought for yourself. You're allowed to buy flowers for yourself. Okay. Most people like flowers. And if you don't, that's fine. Maybe you like a good um, um, sprout, plant, something, something that breathes life right? Whatever it is, doesn't have to be roses or anything, okay? You're allowed to buy those for yourself. Maybe it is chocolate that you can't wait to consume. (laughs) Did anybody get chocolate over the holidays? If you chose to celebrate in whatever way, did you like have the chocolate? I 
had the chocolate that I got in my stocking from my parents. And I hoarded that shit. Like that is not my kid's chocolate. That is my chocolate that no one else will touch. I will hide it because that is my chocolate. (laughs) That goes in my pleasure altar. Okay. Like that, that's mine. That is pleasure for me. Okay. Um, maybe it's a bottle of wine. If you are somebody that chooses to drink, if that is something that (laughs) I bought my, yes, do it. Yes. I love it. I love it. If you are somebody that chooses to drink, maybe wine is just like a perfect breath of fresh air for you, right? Maybe it is a beautifully aromatic tea, right? Like something that just like formulates those senses for you and brings pleasure to your body. Maybe it is the softest, coziest blanket in your home. One that is just for you, that you hide away in your pleasure altar, something that is just for you. Maybe it includes a journal and your favorite pen. I'm, I'm a person that has my favorite pen, right? Like I, the, the one that just writes like Ugh, so smoothly, like it just does things to my brain when I write with it. Uh, maybe it's a journal and your favorite pen right? Those things that bring about this sense of pleasure that encourage rest, pleasure, and relaxation. That's what the pleasure altar should contain. Rest, relaxation, and pleasure. Things that bring that to your body. In an altar space, you can remind, it it can help to remind you of your intention in that space and function as a support to spontaneous practice. Creating a pleasure mantra can also be helpful. Maybe if you have a basket that you have your treats in, that you also have a mantra on the wall right there in front of it. Pleasure is safe. I am worthy of feeling good. I trust my desires. I belong to what I long for. Pleasure is my birthright. I am allowed to advocate for the pleasure that feels right to my body. So maybe it's putting one of those affirmations that connect to you with that space. I want you to begin by getting consent from your body. Consent is something that we are going to keep talking about this week in vast detail because consent is the focus of all of my conversations consent and safety. That's how we have all of these conversations. Begin by getting consent from your body. If you have some idea of what you'd like to do for your practice on any given day, perhaps hold an object that you would be interacting with and feel your body's response to it. Do you subconsciously rock forward? Does your heart skip a beat? Do you rock backward, protecting your heart? Do you feel a full body yes? Get to know what both a yes and a no feels like in your body. Have you ever once thought about getting consent from your own body and what that feels like in your body? Not from another human, but from your own body. Understanding and responding to what your body's telling you. Creating a culture of consent begins with incorporating a sense of safety and trust in our bodies during these solo practices. How else will you know what we consent to with others? We often talk about consent in the context of other beings back and forth, but we so rarely talk about our bodies. Getting consent from your body. Your body knows what it wants, right? And we're so conditioned to turn that off. We're so conditioned to just push that away because we have things that we have to get done or we have other people that are dependent on us or whatever, right? Like all of the narrative that we have. Get consent from your body. Listen to what your body is telling you and how your body responds. Make it mindful. Whatever you choose to do as that pleasure practice, devote your whole attention and awareness to it. Who in here has an iPhone? I am obsessed with this feature on my iPhone. 
of the do not disturb sections, put what, if you have an iPhone, put one of those as pleasure practice where your phone does not go off when you've got pleasure practice turned on. You get to give your full attention to your body. You get to connect with your body. Put that on there. Allow for pleasure practice to be something that you are focused into. Put boundaries around it. Set a timer if it helps lock the door, if it makes you feel more safe. Become curious not only about the objects you may be interacting with or the activities that you may be doing, but about your body's resistance or receiving of them. This is that whole monologue around consent. Is your body resisting this? Is it struggling to stay in tune? Is it struggling to be aware? Is it struggling to connect? Why? Why is there a resistance? And what is your body like? Yes, I'm all in. Like, this feels good. This is great. This is pleasure. What things are those? What things create resistance? Make it embodied. Get the whole body involved in your pleasure practice each day. Make it a full body experience by doing a body scan from the soles of your feet to the crown of your head before, during, and after. Check in with the whole body. Incorporate touch and full body awareness whenever possible, remembering to let the body lead the entire experience. Obtain consent from your body and let your body lead. Make meaning. Take time to reflect on the experience afterwards. So maybe having that journal there to reflect on that experience, getting really super curious about any shifts that occurred. Questions such as what was your resistance before? When were you finally able to let that go? And how did you feel differently afterward? Would you do it again? What would you change? Unpack those memories, shadows, and stories that arose throughout that entire experience. This practice, creating a daily pleasure practice, can quite literally change everything about your life. Getting in tune with your body and what your body seeks affects your relationships with other people. It affects the dynamics around you. It, is, it affects your sexual health. It affects your mental and emotional health. What can be boiled down to just a simple pleasure practice is so much deeper and allows for us to get that experience of feeling held, of connecting to of consenting with our body. This is the basis of where the rest of the conversations go. Getting in tune with our own pleasure and our own bodies. But why do we do this, right? Like this can all be like this beautiful thing that I'm sharing with you of like, oh, that sounds so wonderful. This is so great. I would love to implement that. But like, why? What is the power in it? Why go through the effort of creating a pleasure practice and why focus on our sexual health? What does that even do? Okay, here's a very short list because there's so much more to this that we're going to address in the later days. There's a very short list. There is literal scientific evidence, literal statistics on how it is shown that sex is extremely beneficial to our health. Pleasure is extremely beneficial to our health. Sex activates a variety of neurotransmitters that impact, blah, blah, that impact not only our brains, but several other organs in our body. Let me say that again. Sex activates a variety of neurotransmitters that impact not only our brains, but several other organs in our body. Some things to think about, lower blood pressure, better immune system, better heart health, even including a lower risk of heart disease, improved self-esteem, decrease in depression and anxiety, 
increase in libido. Immediate, listen to that word, immediate natural pain relief. Better sleep. Increased intimacy and closeness to a sexual partner. Overall stress reduction, both physiologically and emotionally. Hear me when I say sex and pleasure is good for your body. Type that in the comments. Sex and pleasure is good for your body. Sex and pleasure is good for your body. Pleasure is something that your body craves. You deserve to have consensual, safe, and pleasurable sex and solo play. You deserve to have consensual, safe, and pleasurable sex and solo play. I threw a bunch at you tonight. I threw a lot of things at you tonight. And I know that the range of emotions were felt in what I talked about. So as a recap to what we have addressed tonight, and remember that you can always go back and rewatch, okay? If there was things that you were like, I need that to sit a little longer. I need that to sink in a little bit longer. We talked about how to unpack what you believe about sex. We talked about how to give yourself permission to experience pleasure. We talked about integrating a daily pleasure practice. And then we talked about the actual statistics behind the importance of sex and pleasure. Tomorrow, we're going to be going deep into unpacking that backstory that we started and creating a new story. Okay, there's a lot that tomorrow is going to bring with. So sit with what came up tonight, journal, write in your workbook, sit with the things that have come up to be ready for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for spending this hour with me tonight. And I cannot wait to see you again tomorrow at 8 p.m. Be sure to check tonight's action step. It will be posted as soon as I end this live. Investing this hour, each day, literally has the ability to change the story around sex in your home, in your life, in the children around you, in their lives. Literally having the power to change that story around sex. You deserve this hour each night. And I cannot wait to see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Be ready for that action step.